Wow, that has never been said. <laughs> there were so many competing events tonight, including the aforementioned talks. Um, and so I'm just really uh, delighted and appreciative that you're all here. I'm Lisa Helke. I'm in the philosophy department here at Gus Davis. I'm the person formerly known as the world's formerly junior, <laughs> oldest junior colleague. Uh, I don't know what it is. Anyway, uh, enough about me. What do you think? Uh, I want to introduce our guest tonight. Um, I first met Scott Pratt, I think, when he was working on a dissertation on John Dewey up at the University of Minnesota. It was lonely because there weren't really very many John Dewey people up there. And so he said, you know, could we like just get together and talk about Dewey? And I, of course, said, yes, 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 yes. So we struck up a friendship over the most important philosopher. Um, and at the time, Scott was, I think, simultaneously writing a dissertation, being the primary parent of a new infant, and working at Hamlin University in the admission office. And I still don't, it explains why you since written 73 books because they're obviously good at time management. We should ask, actually ask him about that. He, uh, prior to going to University of Minnesota, he did his undergraduate degree at Beloit College in Wisconsin. Um, after his dissertation, he uh, got a job at the University of Oregon where he has been actually ever since, 19 years he just said. Um, and he served there in all kinds of capacities, director of grad studies, the chair of the department, and he also actually for a little while left for an administrative post before uh, returning to the classroom. Um, Scott, I really credit Scott with changing, being one of the most important persons for changing my way of thinking about the history of American philosophy, which is near and dear to my heart. A number of his books have been hugely influential. I mean, one of them is called Native Pragmatism, uh, which looks at um, the, the ways in which Native philosophy already were um, shaping American thought, particularly the tradition of thought known as pragmatism. He wrote with two other, he edited with two other colleagues, an anthology of American philosophy that starts with uh, responses to slavery. And for me, as somebody trying to think about how can we do American philosophy differently, this book was transformative and it was uh, the spine of my American philosophy class for a lot of years, until this year. Um, he, um, I just learned tonight at dinner that he wrote a book on logic, which I didn't know anything about. Right. <laughs> He also um, is in the process of finishing up a book on the history of American philosophy, which my class is, is reading this semester, and we're finding enormously helpful for, for contextualizing these uh, sometimes canonical and sometimes not so canonical figures in, um, in the American tradition. Um, and right now he's working on a book about post-Civil War genocides of Native American people. Um, and the work tonight sort of comes out of that. Um, but I think Agnes Davis really the only thing that I needed to say about Scott is he was Kara's dissertation advisor. <laughs> so without further ado. Uh, that was, thank you very much, Lisa. And uh, thank you all for coming. And Lisa, that, that was a great thank you introduction. Oh, really appreciate it. Um, so, uh, so my purpose tonight is to talk about um, American Indian philosophy after the Dakota War. And I'm going to start by talking about the Dakota War some, and then I'm going to talk about some uh, Native American philosophers, American Indian philosophers, who I think are influenced by a line of thinking that comes in the wake of the Dakota War. And you'll sort of see how that comes together as we go. Um, before I start, though, I'd like to, I'd like to uh, begin by acknowledging that we are on, as you all know, Dakota land. It's easy to forget the history of this place, given the distance from the events that led to the founding of towns like St. Peter and Mankato. But it is nevertheless important to remember, especially if we're to learn anything about the places where we live. So Dakota people, when they greet each other, often say something in Dakota, which I'm going to pronounce now, but my accent is terrible. How Mita Kuyapi, Awasan, Kante Wastea, Nape, Siuzapi Do. Hello, my relatives. With a good heart, I greet you all with a handshake. My purpose, as I said a minute ago, is to discuss the American philosophical, the American Indian philosophical tradition that emerged after the Dakota War. Between the war in 1862 and the massacre at Wounded Knee Creek in 1890, American Indian resistance to settler colonialism changed. That is, the resistance that emerged in the Dakota War changed its character to what I'm going to argue is actually a philosophical resistance. 
In response to new situations, a pan-Indian movement emerged that tried to find common ground among the diverse nations of indigenous Americans and to make a case for the necessity of indigenous ways of life. I will try to set out the basic commitments of the resulting philosophical views that in a sense explain why Luther standing there, who's a Native American philosopher from the mid 20th century, would say that only the Indian can save America. So on August 17th, now most of you probably have already heard this story of the Dakota War. How many of you have studied it or read about it? That's great, okay. So I'm gonna go kind of quickly through the history, but if there are questions afterward, we can kind of come back to it. On August 17th, 1862, uh, the picture in the background, by the way, is a picture of Birch Coulee, which is uh, um, uh, the major battle in uh, the Dakota War. Um, on August 17th, four Dakota, Santee Sioux, uh, hunters killed five white settlers in Acton Township in Meeker County. After the hunters returned to their village, it was decided after some debate that war with the settlers was necessary. That's Little Crow. He was the leader of the band that uh, the, the four hunters uh, belonged to. Within days, Dakota warriors attacked settlers and soldiers all along the Minnesota River Valley. A month and a half later, when the war ended, more than 600 settlers had been killed. About 70 of them were soldiers, along with about 100 Dakota. Um, this is a picture, actually, it's kind of hard to see, of uh, refugees fleeing the first days of the Dakota War. Um, uh, people all along the, the Minnesota River Valley uh, headed south, headed out of, out of the region of the Dakotas, uh, because um, the, the native warriors were attacking um, in isolated cabins as well as towns and so forth. Um, say a little something about the casualties. So on September 26th, that's uh, uh, 1862, nearly 2,000 Dakota, convinced by General Sibley that they would be well treated, surrendered at a place called Camp Release uh, near Montevideo, Minnesota, shortly after the Battle of Wood Lake, where a group of Dakota warriors were defeated by troops under Sibley and one of the Dakota war leaders, Mankato, the guy that Mankato is named after, that guy, um, was killed. Uh, as I said, 2,000 surrendered. Um, of the 2,000, 300 were immediately arrested, 303 were re or immediately re arrested by uh, General Sibley and tried for rape and murder. And just over 1,600 others were removed to uh, this location. Um, this is uh, the view from uh, Fort Snelling. This was a camp below Fort Snelling, usually referred to as a prison camp. You see it was walled. And it uh, housed 1,600 Dakota through the winter months of 1862-63. Uh, meanwhile, the 303 Dakota men who were arrested and tried were held uh, on, at Sibley Park in Mankato. Of course, it wasn't called that. Those uh, of the 1,600 that survived the winter uh, at Fort Snelling, um, those, the, the remainder were shipped by steamboat down the Mississippi and to Missouri, uh, to, to the Missouri River, and then up the Missouri River to a place called Crow Creek in South Dakota. In fact, uh, by, uh, 18, by 18, sorry, by 1864, nearly all the Dakota that lived in Minnesota had been removed and most of them went to reservations in the Dakota Territory, and that's a picture of Crow Creek, a pretty desolate spot. Others remained in, in uh, Minnesota, but went underground. Many of them became farmers and Christians, uh, and even as they struggled to remain Dakota. The murder of the five settlers at Acton had been unplanned. The response by the Dakota to go to war, according to the often told tale, uh, there's usually an account given as to why the war started. And the, the normal story says it's the result of years of mistreatment by the federal government and the traders who made their fortunes selling overpriced food and supplies to the Indians. When the Civil War began in April 6, 1862, and don't forget the Dakota War and the Civil War happened at the same time, right? So April 1862, the U.S. entered the federal government entered into the war against the southern secessionist states and, uh, and began to military engagement and drew a lot of troops from the, what was then the Northwest into the battle. 
um, and also a lot of resources. And one of the consequences of the resources being drained into the war were that the, the treaty payments that were guaranteed by the US government to be paid to the Dakota were held up, right? Because there was only a amount of money. So the, the federal government decided not to send the money to the, to the Dakota. The result of this was, through the summer of 1862, um, a, a huge lack of food uh, and eventually starvation um, for, the, for the Dakota who had been counting on access to food and supplies as a result of the payments. Well, in August uh, 1862, um, at uh, the Upper Sioux Agency, this is a picture of one of the remaining buildings, um, uh, the Dakota had had enough and they uh, came to the agency and they threatened to to occupy the, the store, storehouses and remove the food and supplies and so forth. The person who was in charge at the time, a guy named Galbraith, convinced them that this was not a good idea by pointing a cannon at the storehouse and saying, if you try to take it, we'll blow up all the supplies. He said, all right, all right, fine. Um, we'll stand down if we get supplies. And the traders there agreed. Unfortunately, the traders there were not all the traders there were. When the uh, when uh, the Dakota arrived at the Lower Sioux Agency to collect the supplies there, um, there, the trader who was in charge, a guy named Andrew Myrick, refused. And apparently said something to the effect of, let them eat grass or their own dung. Uh, Myrick uh, later was killed and his body was discovered with his mouth stuffed full of grass um, in response to this, this, uh, this uh, declaration. The war on this account, the causes of the war, uh, the war on this account was a response to greed and mistreatment. But that's not the whole story. Um, a chief named Big Eagle, uh, in, uh, uh, who was uh, one of the leaders near the upper agency, remembered the cause differently. Speaking to the St. Paul Pioneer newspaper in 1894, Big Eagle recalled this. The whites, he said, were always trying to make the Indians give up their life and live like white men. And the Indians did not know how to do, it, do that and did not want to anyway. It seemed too sudden to make such a change. If the Indians had tried to make the whites live like them, the whites would have resisted. And it was the same way with the Indians. By way of counterfactual, Big Eagle declared that the resistance was not about poor treatment or missing annuity payments or even the greed of traders like Myron, but about defending a way of life. Resistance by force, however, provided no solution. Though I never took part in the war, Big Eagle said, I was against it. I had to be, I, I had been to Washington and knew the power of the whites and that they would finally conquer us. Whatever the resistance the Dakota would offer, Big Eagle said, it would not be by force of arms. Even as the wars continued over the next 30 years, the resistance shifted ground as the project of making Indians live like white men also changed character. After the Dakota War, everyone's familiar with this part of the story, after the Dakota War, Abraham Lincoln commuted the sentences of all but 39 of the 303 warriors that had been arrested uh, and sentenced uh, the remainder, uh, and had been sentenced to death by uh, General Sibley. Interestingly, Lincoln thought that hanging 303 people would be too extreme. And so he said, well, we'll just hang those who were convicted of rape. And so he went through, he had people go through the, the, the minutes of the trial. And each trial lasted about three sentences on a piece of paper. And two of them made specific mention of someone committing a rape. And so there were two people left. And his advisor said, but Abe, because that's what they called it, but Abe, you can't just hang two. The, the settlers will not be happy. And so Lincoln went through and selected a total of 39 and sent the list to Sibley. And then followed with another letter letting one more person uh, be saved. And then on December 26th, the day after Christmas, 1862, in downtown Mankato, this is the picture that was published in the New York Times. Uh, in downtown Mankato, a huge structure was built, and in the course of 30 minutes, all 38 Dakota men were hung, hanged by uh, the U.S. Army. 
Later, uh, this stone monument was erected. Uh, I was talking to some of my family that lives in Mankato, and they remember this thing. But it vanished under suspect circumstances, though there are rumors about where it went. The monument that was this one is now replaced by a buffalo in Reconcil Reconciliation Park. So next time you're in Mankato, uh, stop down by the library and you can see the site. Among the people who were involved in the war were uh, Shakopee, who has a town named after him, and this fellow named Medicine Bottle. The two of them escaped to Canada after the war, but uh, were kidnapped by some Canadian citizens who wanted the bounty and brought back to St. Paul, where they were imprisoned at Fort Snelling, tried, and then they were hung, as the picture of their hanging says, on November 11, 1865. This marked the end of the Dakota War. It was the end of the war, but of course the resistance didn't stop. The new resistance, the one that followed the war, looked different. The new, uh, the new resistance, the post-war resistance, was exemplified by the work of a man named Oyesha, whose father, uh, Wakandi Ota, or many lightnings, had participated in the Dakota War, and after it, fled with Medicine Bottle and Shakopee, those two people I just mentioned a minute ago, to Canada. Oyesha, uh, who was left behind, was raised by his grandparents until 1873, when his father returned with a new name, Jacob Eastman, now a Christian convert, and urged his son to do likewise and learn the ways of settler culture. Oyesha, now Charles Eastman, attended Beloit College Preparatory School in Wisconsin. I uh, also attended Beloit College. <laughs> and that's my only interest in Charles Eastman. <laughs> he attended uh, Beloit College Preparatory School and then went to Knox College in Illinois and then with a scholarship from Christian missionaries, completed his undergraduate degree at Dartmouth and got a, a, a medical doctorate uh, at Boston University. On graduation, Eastman was hired by the Bureau of Indian Affairs to serve as a medical officer at Pine Ridge Reservation back in South Dakota. He arrived there in the early fall of 1890. Two months later, on December 29, 1890, the 7th U.S. Cavalry, the regiment that had been decimated by the Lakota in 1876 at the Little Bighorn, uh, surrounded a camp of uh, Lakota and uh, attacked them near Wounded, Creek, Wounded Knee Creek mm -hmm. in South Dakota. Nearly 350 men, women, and children were killed. Two days later, Charles Eastman, the, medical direct, the, the, the chief medical officer at Pine Ridge, led a group of civilians, Indian and white, to the site of the Wounded Knee Massacre to look for survivors. There weren't any. In his autobiography, he wrote, it took all of my nerve to keep my composure in the face of this spectacle and of the excitement and grief of my Indian companions, nearly every one of whom was crying aloud or singing his death song. It was, he said, a severe ordeal, especially, quote, for one who has so lately put all his faith in the Christian love and lofty ideals of the white man." Close quote. Eastman's resistance that emerged over the next decade would stand against the commitments of settler society and for a set of commitments, what I'll call a philosophical standpoint, that sought to preserve American Indian ways of life in the face of what Sidner Larson, a Grovan Indian and author, has called a post-apocalyptic world. Uh, Larson, who used to be at the University of Oregon, is now at Iowa State. Um, this notion of being a, living in a post-apocalyptic world is worth sort of writing down or keeping in mind. Right? From Larson's perspective, if you're Native American, the world of the 20th and 21st centuries are literally after the apocalypse. After 95% of the population of the Americas is decimated by disease and war and poverty and hunger and cold and so on. And the people living in the 20th and 21st century who are native are doing it against a backdrop of that kind of history. But his claim is more rich than that. It's not just that native people are living in a post-apocalyptic world. He thinks that everyone is living in a post-apocalyptic world. The problem with many of us is we haven't noticed it yet. 
the Native American resistance that began after the Dakota War through the work of people like Eastman is in a, in a really important way both an acknowledgement of a post-apocalyptic world in which Native Americans live in and an attempt to convince the rest of us that we should notice the kind of world that we are living in, right? that it is for us as well post-apocalyptic. Rather than offering a Dakota vision of survival, however, Eastman and many other Indi American Indian thinkers of the 20th century adopted a pan-Indian perspective. In the face of removal, reservation life, poverty, and boarding schools that sought to eliminate native language and culture, tribal traditions were joined together in a common struggle, not only to preserve their diverse worlds, but to make a case for their necessity. Let's just say that again. They're not just making a case to preserve indigenous people, but they want to say that indigenous ways of life are necessary, almost literally, to the survival of the place. Right? This is a central piece of this uh, philosophical resistance. The resulting vision shared four philosophical commitments. The first commitment was to the idea that things are relational. Um, that is, things exist only in and through relations with other things that are also relational. Such relationality gave rise to the second commitment, the importance of place. That is, the particular relations that characterize individuals and their groups. Third, placed relations were not given or static, but imbued with what is often called power. Not power as force in the ordinary sense, nor power as the product of systematic domination, but power as an individuating and correcting, uh, connecting motive that seeks fulfillment of purposes. And then fourth, as a consequence of the resulting diversity of powers marked by different <coughs> relational locations, this philosophical tradition was committed as well to ontological, epistemic, and phenomenological pluralism. So for those who aren't philosophers in the room, ontological means being. Right? So the pluralism of being. Epistemic means knowledge, right? That is the pluralism of knowledges. There are different knowledges that don't necessarily all go together. And phenomenological pluralism refers to experience. There are different experiences. There's a pluralism of experiences. This philosophical view is committed to that broad notion of pluralism. Taken together, these commitments lead to a conception of agency or personhood that has, has uh, three implications. First, it challenges the central commitments of the dominant Western philosophy, in particular the standards of non-contradiction excluded middle and identity, and I'll talk about that later, that are the foundations of Western conceptions of what it is to be a rational agent. Second, it shows the priority of indigenous conceptions of the world over the dominant perspective of settler colonialism. And third, it proposes a politics of place that recognizes the relationships between humans and between humans and the land and other beings that make up the world. So that's, that's where we start. Now I want to spend a little time looking at some specific philosophers to sort of cash out these uh, philosophical commitments and then we'll talk about sort of in general these implications of, of this sort of resistance. So in, eight, in 1911, Charles Eastman published a book called The Soul of the Indian, whose title recalled W.E.B. Du Bois's 1903 work of black, of black resistance called The Souls of Black Folk. Eastman's book was presented as an account of American Indian religion. It is this, but it also offers a philosophical framework used by indigenous people in their stand against empire. Central to this framework was the conviction that, as he put it, every creature possesses a soul in some degree, though not necessarily a soul conscious of itself. The tree, the waterfall, the grizzly bear, each is an embodied force, and, such an object, and as such an object of reverence. In a world in which every creature, that is every created thing, has a soul, Eastman argued that people behave differently and with respect. Framing the resulting way of life as religious, Eastman explained, every act of an Indian's life is, in a very real sense, a religious act. He recognizes the spirit in all creation and believes that he draws from it spiritual power. Thanks are due to the creatures with whom one interacts, and freely giving back to those creatures makes reciprocal relations also mutually constructive. This ontological view of relational beings also provided a critical perspective on settler society. As a child, Eastman said, I understood how to give. I have forgotten that grace since I became civilized. I live in the natural, uh, I lived the natural life, whereas now I live the artificial. Any pretty pebble was valuable to me then, 
every growing tree and object of reverence. Now I worship with the white man before a painted landscape whose value is estimated in dollars. Thus the Indian is reconstructed as the natural rocks are ground to powder and made into artificial blocks which may be built into the walls of modern society. Even, there's almost no better image of assimilation, by the way, than that one, right? Grinding the, the natural rocks of people into powder, making bricks, and then putting them in a wall, right? That's assimilation. Even as he framed a conception of indigenous life in contrast to, uh, to the reconstruction faced in settler society, he also made room to acknowledge Western religion as a critical tool. He said, there is no such thing as Christian civilization. I believe that Christianity and modern civilization are opposed and irreconcilable, and that the spirit of Christianity and of our ancient religion is essentially the same. Eastman, as I said, was part of a pan-Indian movement that began in the late 19th century through the work of a number of American Indian intellectuals, many educated at boarding schools. The signal organization for the movement was the Society of American Indians. It was founded in 1911, two years after the National Association for the Advancement of Colored Indians, NAACP. Among the associate or non-Indian founding members of the SAI was the co-founder of the NAACP, W.E.B. Du Bois, social gospel movement leader Lyman Abbott, and actually a philosopher from Cornell University, uh, Frank Philly. The SAI's program was never clearly settled, but the work of several of its leaders uh, adopted views that followed the path set by Eastman. Uh, the first one I want to mention is Arthur Parker. Arthur Parker was a Seneca Indian who also served as the editor of the SAI Journal and both affirmed the need for American Indians to assimilate to the dominant economy and at the same time made a case for sustaining aspects of Indian culture as a means of combating the evils of industrial capitalism. In his first address to the SAI, and I should notice, right, uh, I should know, Parker was a Seneca, right? Eastman was Dakota. Um, the SAI was actually a union of people from different tribal backgrounds, right? Which, which meant that they didn't share a common language route, um, but they felt that they shared a common problem, right? Settler colonialism. And what they tried to do was generate a view that could do two things. It could oppose settler colonialism on the one hand, and it could reaffirm the diverse tribal cultures that they came from. So they weren't advocating like adopting some membership in some giant tribe called Pan-Indian. They were adopting a view that opposed a certain way of thinking, but then actually supported diversity among its members, right? The, the preservation of different cultural traditions. Um, so in his first address to the SAI, Parker concluded, the true aim of educational effort should not be to make the Indian a white man, but simply a man normal to his environment. Here, standing against empire, commercial greed, and assorted conventional ideas of white civilization required the opposite movement. Indians, he said, should cease to struggle against the culture that engulfs them, that they should become a factor of it, so that they should use their, re their revitalized influence and more advantageous position in asserting and developing the great ideals of their race for the good of all mankind. That's his picture, but there's the quote. There's the quote. Sorry, I skipped that. The first one, this notion of being normal to his environment, that notion of fitness is really important to note. And then the idea that by adopting the economic model of the dominant culture, would give Native people an opportunity to preserve their own cultural differences is really sort of a linchpin of this program uh, from the SAI. Uh, this view of, of indigenous activism, he argued in 1916, stood explicitly against aspects of the new system of genocide that developed in the late 19th century. In the beginning, there was an endeavor to adopt, or excuse me, an, an endeavor to occupy the land forcibly and by various means to exterminate its barbaric owners. This is the Dakota War. The idea of extermination persisted for a long time, but there was, a, there was enough sentiment to bring about a new course, that of segregation. So what followed the Dakota War was almost literally the same thing that followed the, the Dakota War, that is segregation. That is, Native people were pushed to reservations where they had to get permits to leave. So segregation became the new, the new plan. 
For Parker, segregation was not a program designed to foster tribes, but was rather a continuation of the system of genocide that began uh, with the process of displacement and removal. Segregation, he said, did more to exterminate the Indians than did bullets. Rigorously guarded reservations became a place of debasement. The practices carried out, Parker charge, have permitted the soul of the race to sink beneath the evils of civilization into misery, ignorance, disease, and despondency. The correct response, Parker argued, was to demand that settler society return certain stolen or destroyed aspects of indigenous life that could support the renewal of tribal cultures and the possibility of reciprocity with other cultures. These included in, uh, indigenous intellectual and community life and economic independence. A second member of, I think this is important to note, a second member of the Society, uh, the Society of American Indians was Laura Cornelius Kellogg. She was an Oneida Indian uh, from Wisconsin, as a matter of fact. Uh, she was uh, uh, served as the secretary for S the SAI, and in her first address to the society, she challenged the culture that had come to surround Native peoples by identifying its failures. The development of intense individualism and the age of unprecedented prosperity no doubt are largely responsible for the selfishness of the American people. To this, everlast, uh, this overarching charge, she added several specific evils, evils including child labor, industrial accidents, unemployment, and unsanitary living conditions. Against these consequences of settler society, Cornelius Kellogg maintained, quote, that the, lo the line of least resistance to the greatest possible good under our present circumstances is to citizenize the possibilities and to reorganize the opportunities of the Indian at home, to organize the Indian's holdings into a system of economic advantages. As a response to the reservation system and its isolation and poverty, Cornelius Kellogg proposed the development of a small scale, uh, of small scale local economies that could sustain individual tribes and participate in the wider industrial economy. In her book, Our Democracy and the American Indian, published in 1920, Cornelius Kellogg presented her conception of local development aimed at making new environment, a new environment and a real home by adopting traditional village life, adapting, adapting traditional village life to the economic situation of the 20th century. Cornelius Kellogg, Parker, and Eastman each presented what they took to be a widely shared American Indian perspective that reaffirmed that the world of indigenous peoples was made up of interdependent relational beings sustained by their places. In this context, native people had the power to survive despite efforts by the surrounding settler society to assimilate or destroy them. This set of ontological commitments, rather than leading to the demand for canyon and unity, demanded that indigenous people work to foster diverse places as a key to survival. Cornelius Kellogg de called the demand for such places the Lolomi program, using the Hopi word for perfect goodness be upon you. Even as the SAI worked to respond to the dominant culture, they did so by developing a philosophical resistance. The first implication is that if there are, oh sorry, I have to go back to my other one. There it is. So, Outside the SAI, so the SAI was a kind of intellectual bastion. Most of the people in the SAI had gone to boarding school. Most of them had lost access to their original languages, right? But had as a common language English. And this provided actually the opportunity for this cooperation across, across cultural traditions. At the same time, outside of the SAI, there were some other leaders, in particular Luther Standing Bear, who may have heard of Luther Standing Bear before. <coughs> Standing Bear was a member of the Oglala Lakota and was among the first students taken to the Carlisle Boarding School in Pennsylvania where he was trained as a tinsmith. Uh, he said in his autobiography, there wasn't much tinsmithing going on in the reservation. <laughs> when he returned to Carlisle, when he returned from Carlisle, he actually worked for a time as a teacher and a shopkeeper because there was no tinsmithing uh, at the Pine Ridge Reservation. He then moved actually to another reservation, um, the Standing Rock. Reservation. In 1905, he was elected chief of the Oglala, and after much controversy and conflict uh, with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, he left South Dakota in 1912 to go to Hollywood, where he became an actor. And he was an actor from 1912 to 1939, um, acting in the silent movies and then the talkies, usually playing what kind of role? Indian. Not always, actually. It turned out he also played uh, ethnic non-native people, 
particularly Eastern Europeans and Italians. And he was in a famous movie about uh, a Bolshevik, something about the, the, the Bolshevik rebel or something like that, and he was one of the, the ethnic Eastern Europeans. So, quite an actor, apparently carried that off nicely. Late in, uh, later in life, he became an activist against conditions imposed on the Lakota and Dakota peoples and wrote four books. In his last, titled Land of the Spotted Eagle, published in 1933, Standing Bear diagnosed the failure of white society. He said, he said, the white man does not understand the Indian. For the same reason, he does not understand America. Got that? The white man does not understand the Indian because he does, in the same way he doesn't understand America. He's too far removed from its formative processes. The roots of his tree of life have not yet grasped rock and soil. In contrast, he says, in the Indian, the spirit of the land is still vested, and it will be until other men are able to divine and meet its rhythm. Men must be born and reborn to belong. Their bodies must be formed of the dust of their forefathers' bones. Standing Bear was clear about the future, uh, about the future life of North America. He said this, it is now time for the destructive order to be reversed. In denying the Indian his ancestral rights and heritages, the white race is but robbing itself. But America can be revived, rejuvenated, by recognizing a nature school of thought the Indian can save America. In the 1960s, or by the 1960s, the tradition of American Indian philosophy that stood against the settler society found a new voice in the work of Klein Deloria Jr., whose grandfather had been a co-founder of the SAI and whose aunt Ella Deloria was a Columbia-trained ethnographer. Deloria, like his predecessors, offered both a critique of dominant European descended culture in North America and a vision of an alternative world famed, famed, framed by place and peopled by diverse agents, human and otherwise, understood as persons. For Deloria, the central element of what he offers as American Indian philosophy is a particular conception of personhood, right? So think personhood. It's one that rejects the idea that the world, world is reducible to passive matter or to substances <laughs> like matter and mind. So this vision of the world as persons means that everything turns out to be either a person or part of a person. Instead, he offers this uh, uh, founded on what he calls a simple equation. Here's the simple equation. Power and place produce personality. And there's no matter. Power and place produce personality. Put another way, persons, or agents as I call them, uh, are both relational and purposive. As relational, as placed, persons or agents are like points in geometry formed by the intersection of lines. If you think about that, right? Two lines cross and a point's formed, right? The point is formed by the crossing of lines. You can find it that way. Right? However, the example of a point is an insufficient analogy since points are easily pa seen as passive constructions of someone else's activity, whoever drew the line. Agents, things that can act with a purpose, things that can act with a purpose are more than just relational beings. They are also modal, acting toward a possible future that is yet unfulfilled. This aspect of personhood, which he calls power, involves both a determinate past and possible futures that are indeterminate. To say of a tree that it has power is to say that its past is one of tree activity. Its future will at once be constrained by its past. The product of relations with other agents and its own responses from form a starting point. Depending on its activities and those of the agents it next encounters, it could become, this is the tree now, depending upon who it next encounters, it could become lumber, right? for example, or shade for someone on a hot day, or an inspiration, or an advisor for someone who encounters it in need of their own sense of direction. Our tendency in the West is to attribute whatever possibility a thing like a tree has to the possibilities of the human beings, or at least the higher animals, it encounters. But this is to miss the ontological point. This is to miss the point of being. Trees, as well as humans and higher animals and larger systems like rivers, waterfalls, and ecosystems, are relational. They're placed. A tree's past and present are an intersection of activities where human purpose is only part of what has established the possibilities that exist for it in its next days or season. 
The ontology of individuals and groups is a matter of relations and power. That is, they are, to borrow a phrase from John Dewey, active doings and undergoings, such that what they are is better taken as who they are. In sum, Deloria says, every entity has a personality and can experience a measure of free will and choice. Every entity, free will and choice, not our standard view. If ontology is the starting point, then the size and duration of agents are not given in advance, but are the characteristics of the place and power at hand. Individual human beings, as individual agents, live in relation to others, human and otherwise, and seek to fulfill their purposes as those around them do likewise. As Deloria observes, the planet itself is an agent that, as he says, nurtures smaller forms of life, people, plants, birds, animals, rivers, valleys, continents. From the perspective of the smaller forms of life, as members of larger ones, individuals are not independent, but rather are parts of larger agents who also seek to fulfill purposes, and who persist as agents even as their members die and as new members become parts. Tribes and peoples are themselves agential wholes on this account in a context of other such agents sustained by their parts but not reducible to them. Just who then count as agents? The answer may not be known in advance. Since agency is relational, it can make itself apparent only in the process of relating to others. The result for Deloria is that in the moral universe, all activities, events, and entities are related. And consequently, it does not matter what kind of existence an entity employs, enjoys, for the responsibility is always there for it to participate in the continuing creation of reality. So, if the world is composed of agents, as Deloria suggests, there are three further implications that are crucial for the philosophical resistance to settler society. The first, challenges, the first challenges the central principles of what Western philosophy calls rationality. The second implication is the priority of indigenous conceptions of agency over Western, notion, over Western notions, and the third points toward a conception of politics, a place that begins with the recognition of collective agency, or what also may be called sovereignty. Deloria's conception of agent ontology is a notion of ordering that leads to the recognition of boundaries, vagueness, and chance. This is where the philosophy starts getting thick. Between the alternatives that mark the necessity of making a choice, there stands an agent whose character or disposition to act is continuous with both alternatives. Here's the picture. There you are, an agent, faced with a choice. Go to Pratt's talk or go to something else. Right? You can't do both of these things, much as you would like to. Right? You're facing two options, neither of which, both of which you would like to do. Both of them are continuous with you. They're things that you would do, that you would like to do. But you can't do both. It sets up an interesting relationship, right? Both of these options are available to you, they're continuous with you, and in a certain way, they're contradictory because you can't carry them both out. Such formal indeterminate, uh, at the moment of choice, the person or agent in the relation is itself a contradiction whose logical character is formally indeterminate. Such formal indeterminacy applies not only to agents, individuals, but to agents of greater complexity and size, collective agents, long persisting agents, and so on. When a community face, uh, faces alternatives for going forward, for example, to lie with one community or another, the community itself, itself stands in a space uh, between, a space between, a, bound, a boundary continuous with both sides or alternatives. The metaphorical space is at the same time part of one side A and part of the other side B. Since, but since, as an agent faced by real possibilities, the agent is also neither A nor B, since the agent is A and B and not A and not B, by the usual logical rules regarding conjunctions, one can conclude that the agent is both A and not A. And I actually brought a picture. Recognize this? <coughs> Racing fans will. Flag is put out for race during races, lets some driver know that they behave badly. So let's call the white field A and the black field B. Now I have a question. Is the line between A and B black or white? Yes, that is the correct answer, right? Because it is both. It appears to be both and neither, as both. What is, be what is between is A and B, right? it's both. 
um, as neither what is between is not A and not B, which naturally means that the line between is actually A and not A. And all of you have had logic class with Josh already now. That's a contradiction and a problem, right? Contradictions uh, lead you in a bad direction. They leave you unable to go forward in a sense. Thus, the, uh, the agent is logically indeterminate as to its direction. The, the situation does not prescribe how to go forward from this, right? It could be anything. It could be A or not A. And yet, as an agent, it can nevertheless go forward. You all have faced this very situation, and yet here you are, right? Despite the fact that you're an indeterminate contradiction at a certain point, you can still show up and do things. Uh, as an agent, it can nevertheless go forward, making a choice carefully, by deciding carefully, rolling the dice, or acting, um, acting on a guess. Further, from the perspective of an agent who is an observer, when an object on the horizon is vague or unclear in what it is or what it will do, it is not only vague for the observer, but ontologically vague in anticipation of the settlement of its determining relations. Again, making a determination is not simply seeing what is already determined, but it is an ontologically significant act. To recognize agent ontology is to affirm the experience of vagueness as not simply a subjective state, but is characteristic of the world. Boundaries, with their indeterminate character and, the, and vagueness in the connection between things, open the world to the emergence of something new, by choice or by chance, and for ongoing growth and change through the actions of agents. The ontological standing of boundaries and vagueness also leads to the recognition of a particular set of ordering principles that are at the heart of enlightenment philosophy. That is, the ordering principles that have come to frame the dominant Western conception of rational agency, and central to how one understands the relation between things, that is, the idea of orders. These common ordering principles are the principles of non-contradiction, excluded middle, and identity, and are recognized as logical or formal, as well as ontological and epistemic principles. In much of Western culture, these serve as unspoken assumptions about what it is to be and to know. In simplest terms, a quick reminder. Non-contradiction as, as a logical principle holds that a proposition cannot be both true and false. As an ontological principle, it holds that a thing cannot both be and not be what it is. The principle of excluded middle formally holds that a proposition must be either true or false and not something in between. And ontologically, it requires that a thing be uh, either be something, a stone, a human, a Dakota, or not, thus rejecting the idea of something ontologically in between. The principle of identity in logic means that the, thi that, uh, the term is identical with itself, while ontologically identity means that a thing or a person or a category is identical with itself, that is, it remains the thing that it is. Agent ontology, this view of Vine Deloria's and I think this pan-Indian tradition, violates all three principles in each of their versions. Since things are relational, and so subject to change as relations change, the principle of identity cannot always hold. Since the universe of agents is one in which there are indeterminate borders, vagueness, and chance, the principle of excluded middle is rejected. There's always something between them. Since incompatible possibilities are real are, uh, and manifested in the character of agents and boundaries, real or true contradictions are possible. Uh, according to the principles of agent ontology, the middle is not excluded. Things change as a result of changing relations, and contradiction only marks practical conflict and not logical impossibility. The commitments that mark the development of, positive of a positive philosophy about what to expect also point to a critical philosophy aimed at challenging the underlying ordering principles of settler society. While settler society often recognizes the principles of indigenous thought as primitive and irrational, the perspective of American Indian philosophy recognizes an enlightenment thought as legitimate, but a legitimate but uh, limited form of agency. The second implication of uh, uh, agent ontology is that an indigenous conception of agency is prior to the particular notion of rational agency in Western philosophy. In other words, while a native person from this philosophical perspective could recognize the agency of the dominant culture, right, could see how they could be agents, you know, behaving in accordance with their interests and following certain rules, the reverse is not true. 
Native people have to be seen as non-rational because they don't affirm the same principles of rationality that indigenous people do. From the perspective of an indigenous ancient ontology, the agency of enlightenment minds, rational individuals, is one that recognizes only certain forms of action as legitimate agency and categorizes other forms of agency as inferior or even non-agential. The ordering principles of enlightenment, enlightenment philosophy, non-contradiction excluded middle and identity, should be seen as practical rules that only that govern not only, excuse me, that govern not ontology or knowledge in the abstract, but serve as normative principles for action. That is, they, are, they mark a particular kind of agency. Such agency, settler agency, expects borders to be sharp divisions so that one can rightly say everything must be on one side or the other of any given dividing line, and that things re remain ontologically unchanging. From this perspective, there can only be one kind of legitimate agent, the sort that adopts non-contradiction, excluded middle, and identity as guiding principles. Agents who do not are problematic, limited, and even irrational. And so settler agency turns out to be only one way to be an agent, albeit a narrow and sometimes dangerous one. Other kinds of agency can operate by affirming betweenness both formally and ontologically, and lead to the expectation of both a less, cle less clear-cut logical landscape and a more complex world of experience. Indigenous conceptions of agency that emerged historically in contact with European settlers utilize the wider notion and so are able to recognize the narrower form of settler agency as agency nonetheless. While settler agency and Western ethics and epistemology sought legitimate agents in a world composed of non-agents, <coughs> passive rocks, mountains, trees, and animals operating by instinct, the alternative notion of indigenous agency recognizes diverse agents and interests and, con and the consequent need for respect and cooperation. So ultimately, what uh, this resistant indigenous philosoph philosophical position is trying to argue for is a different sense of agency, one in opposition to the sort of standard view of agency that emerges in Western philosophy. And in, as a consequence of it, it gains a certain kind of perspective on Western philosophy. Right? So you could easily see that there's a question of coexistence as possible, right? We understand how you guys can be agents, right? You guys can be legitimate agents. Don't try to make us your kind of legitimate agent. That's a narrowing of what it is to be agent, right? Um, in, in a sense, it's a kind of prescription for coexistence. Ultimately, because I'm running out of time and won't get a chance to talk much about the politics of place, I want to say just a couple of things about it. If it's the case that persons are formed through their relations, they're placed, who you are depends upon who you know, the ground you walk on, the food you eat, and so forth. These places are not themselves just collections of individuals living together in some land that's on a map, but rather are themselves agents, right? They have a kind of ongoing interests and stand in relation to other places as well. If it comes time to worry about things like uh, uh, clean water, for example, um, like uh, questions of global warming and so forth. These are, in, these are concerns not just that affect the self-interest of individual human beings, but affect the interests of tribes, of communities, of larger and larger groups. And it suggests a whole different approach to the question of practical politics. Rather than starting from transcendent rules that state you know, the way things should be, this sort of politics suggests the first thing you have to do is consult the place you live in. Right? Help the place that you're in become the agent it can be, in effect, so that that place and other places can interact. If you look at the politics around the oil, uh, the oil sands pipelines, for example, and read what indigenous people are saying about that process, they're not making declarations about universal principles of, moral, uh, of morality. They're making claims about the way that the pipeline affects the various places it passes through. There's a complete sort of readjustment of what constitutes politics from an indigenous point of view. This is formed not just by the fact that there's a concern about the pipeline, but because there's a kind of starting point that's different. There's a different kind of orientation toward what constitutes an agent, what constitutes being and knowledge and politics. So in the end, this pan-Indian re resistance that we've been talking about is something that continues to be vibrant today. If you, if you uh, read about Idle no, Idle no More, how many of you have read about Idle No More? Google it when you get home. Idle No More is a movement of indigenous people in Canada and the United States 
who are opposed to enough, who are who are working together to oppose uh, the the uh, tar sands pipeline. Um, one uh, the project is helpfully called Sandpiper, by the way. Is your Sandpiper, pretty bird, so yeah. forth, right? Uh, tar sands pipeline. What they're trying to do is is take harness this kind of politics to be a response to that uh, the, that policy that international policy of how to handle um, uh, oil, oil movement and oil drilling. So in the end, um, what began in the Dakota War and produced Charles Eastman in a response to the fact that a forcible response to the Western culture was not going to be successful, turns into a philosophical perspective that is now a kind of viable philosophical outlook for responding to contemporary problems, not just for indigenous people. So we can, we can, in a sense, serve ourselves by thinking back to this tradition, seeing how this tradition evolved its way of thinking about agency, and then think about whether or not what Standing Bear said was true. Is it the case that the Indian can save America? And if so, how? What do we need to learn to make that so? So thank you all for your time. And